Hi. So now we've, we've covered the gamut, past, present, and future. Now we're going to go to a place called Border Town. And it's an exploration of everything we've started to listen about and uh, combined into a theory of hybrid reality. And I'm happy to introduce a professor from the University of California, Long Beach, and a visual artist, Mr. Steve Boyer. Thank you. Hi, everybody. You know, this has been such a great conference, but I'll tell you the biggest mistake I made is after talking to everybody and getting inspired by all these things, I decided I should probably just ditch all my slides because I want to have a conversation with everybody and all the other presenters. But, but then I thought about it and it occurred to me that my slides actually kind of do have that dialogue. The only thing I did do is when, when I got home last night, I downloaded that AI software you know, that you can get the free trial of, and I ran an affinity map with a data sample of one, and the word cloud that came up was frumpy professor. So I ditched my soup, and here we go. So I, I am a professor at, um, it's actually California State University in Long Beach, um, where I'm developing a curriculum for what I call hybrid design. And hybrid design is really just kind of a fancy way of saying, we need to figure out a way to smooth our interfaces between physical and digital environments, because we're spending so much of our time um, in physical. Um, digital environments. And I wanted to start with this image by Magritte. Um, and you know, the human condition is not a pretentious title for a painting. It is actually a deeply profound reference to the situation we're very, very much involved in now. And I think what Magritte understood, and we see this in several of his paintings, what he understood is that we have a uniquely human ability to represent the world that we live in. But we also have the hazard of sometimes not being able to tell the difference between the fabricated and the imagined and the real. And that if we view them both through the same lens as in this painting, through the same set of filters, the differences between them evaporate. And, you know, we all use this in our, in our work to create experiences of enlightenment and education and entertainment, but they can just as easily be used to deceive and manipulate. Um, and I think it's one of the reasons we're in the situation we're in these days. Um, I actually have a friend I shouldn't talk about this because it's very personal, but let's just say has no trust of any information anymore. Has become so distrustful of everything um, that she doesn't even bother reading. It's like, I'm lost. I don't know what to do. So how did I get here? Um, I was actually a video game designer, an electronic toy designer for many, many years. I ran a studio in Chicago. These are not my games. I wish they were. Um, I'd be wearing a fancier suit. Um, but um, I played these games in my studio, um, and they were networked. They were the first networked, um, first-person shooter games. And after work, we would play these in our studio, and you know, we'd run around, hide around the corners, and jump around. And after work, we would go to the little sushi place across the street and drink a lot and eat a lot. Um, and we would have these wonderful recollections and talk about the strategies and say, hey, you know, when you're in that room with the big door, and I was hiding behind, you didn't see me. And um, it occurred to me at that time, wait a minute, these spaces are becoming real. And this is the first time that happened. This was the first time where the memory of the experience of the space was just as real as the memory of the experience of being in the office playing them. And that frightened me a little bit. So what I did at that time, because um, I recognized, I'd play the Buffalo Springfield song here, there's something happening here. And uh, so I closed up shop, I sold my house, I loaded up the truck and I moved to Beverly. Um, well, actually, West LA, but you know, close enough. Um, and I went, I enrolled in the Southern California Institute of Architecture to get my master's degree in architecture to, to study this issue further, because I realized there was a profound cultural shift happening. Um, most of the work that I did in my research at SciArc had to do with what I refer to as active optics. So it had to do with how can we take digital media and bring it into physical space in a way that makes sense. So video screens bore me, they're flat, you know, they're two-dimensional, and you know, when you move around them, you don't get any parallax, they have no depth, they don't coordinate with the environment that they're in. Um, so I did a whole number of experiments. I'm not really going to explain too many of these right now, um, but I also studied a lot of theory. And um, Marshall McLuhan, who is one of my favorites, I uncovered this passage in his book, Understanding Media. So he referred to, and this, by the way, this was written in 1965, I think, so 50 years ago. The telephone is speech without walls. You know, the 
phonograph, music hall, without walls, and this concentration, without walls, without walls, without walls. He was telling us that electronic media and digital media are voiding architecture. They are rendering architecture obsolete. And as architects, I thought that was a really important point to address. So I spent my entire time at SciArc, or most of my time at SciArc, studying this issue. Um, and you know, in the 20 years or the 15 years since I graduated, um, it's gotten worse. You know, and we're all faced with this situation now. And uh, wait, sorry, hold on a sec. Uh, I can answer that. No, but, but you know, it's so true. And when you're locked in this space, and this, you know, this is a daily, you know, you see this every day no matter where you are. I can't leave my classroom after a lecture without bumping into students who are just kind of walking forward like this. And I've got to watch for the end of the stage. That's the danger of these things. Um, I refer these, to these as bifurcated spaces. And they're bifurcated because they force us into a kind of schizophrenic environment. They force us into an environment in which we're struggling to manage the world that's absorbing us in the screen. But I'm doing something wrong here. Um, did my mic go out? So you can all think about daily life as like, you know, in a bifurcated space where you are drawn into that media and at the same time though you're engaged with real people who are next to you. And, and there's a conflict there. And it's a conflict we haven't, you know, a lot of us still consider it read, rude, you know, to talk, you know, on the phone or do your email at the dinner table. But a lot of young people, it's perfectly natural. So there's a cultural change that's going on and we have to address it. And we can't just let it evolve, especially as designers. Am I back on? Is it the hand? Oh, the handheld. Okay. Um, so we have to address this issue. And it actually gets much worse than that. So this is actual studies that were done that show that, and I mean, this is a real study, that, that there's an anesthetic aspect of these devices that we use. Um, and so I coined another term, which I call anesthetic media. So when you're sitting on an airplane, you know, those screens aren't there. They're not there to enlighten you. They're not there to entertain you. They're there to take away the pain of being cramped into a tiny space. And, and I believe that's absolutely true. Now, you know, I, I used to travel a lot, and I love sitting by the window. I'm a window seat guy, because I love looking at the landscape, and I look down, and you know, what a beautiful world we live in. And, and you can look at the clouds, and the mountains, and the ocean, and the cities. Um, but then, about 15 or 20 years ago, I noticed that the flight attendants would start saying, you know, we're about to start the in-flight entertainment. If you're sitting by the window, please lower your, your window shade so people can enjoy the in-flight entertainment. And I was always deeply offended by that. So. My solution to that was to create the window cam. So the window cam, I think I have a laser on here. The window cam is a little camera that points outside a plexiglass turret that's mounted to the outside of the plane with an LCD screen facing the other way so that when I look out the window, I can look at the landscape without disturbing the passengers next to me who want to watch the Jim Carrey movie. Ironically, five years later, I was on a flight to Hong Kong, and there it is. So. Somebody was listening in on that room, um, and now it's even going further, another five years after that. So when I talked earlier about active optics, um, this is one of the experiments I did. I'm interested in the optics of space, in the optics of physical space, about sight lines and parallax and perspective and shading, and how those things can be drawn into physical environments. This was one of my experiments I call the architectural zoetrope. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but it works very much like a zoetrope. Um, but by sensing your point of view, it'll project a different image in a corner. Um, another one of my inventions at the time I call the Fresnel video window because I'm very, very much interested in using video as a window and, you know, as opposed to a place to amplify space as opposed to draw new content into space. Um, the Fresnel window is based on the idea of the Fresnel lens, um, which collapses a curved, bulky surface into a flat one. And it turns out that just like the dark ride that we, whoops, I was supposed to be pressing the laser button. Um, just like the dark ride that had the toroidal screens, that the reason we have toroidal screens is that when you're standing at the right spot, there's an equal distance between each of the surfaces, the surface, and it's perpendicular to your point of view. So that's what you get with the toroid. Um, so what I decided to do is break that up into smaller pieces and then collapse it into a flat plane. So you're always perpendicular, you've always got a perpendicular point of view to the screen, and um, not equidistant anymore, but close enough. Um, this is, uh, you know, I work on an academic budget and an academic schedule, so I'm actually just getting around to building this right now. 
Um, this is it. This is kind of what I imagine the real life experience is going to be. And when I first did this, I thought, you know what, that kind of looks insect lensy, not so interesting. But then I started thinking about the work of David Hockney. You know, and the way David Hockney's work and his photo collages in particular, they match perspective way better than two-dimensional unprocessed images do. So the, this isn't the best example of Hockney's work, but I encourage you to look at his photo collage work in particular because it much more closely matches the way we actually experience the world. You know, we don't take photographs with our eyes, and if you get into visual, visual science, um, it actually turns out that we construct our visual world through a very, very complex set of fragmented information. Um, so at the end of all this, what I really finally came upon, and it took me years to come up with this statement, um, but that digital media really voids our space because it draws the viewer into the space of the media. And I really just wanted to turn that around. And I got to grab my phone again because the gesture is as simple as this. I wanted to amplify space by drawing the media into the space of the viewer. And this is what I refer to as hybrid, a hybrid design. And it's a gesture that's as simple as this. We go from this where I'm locked in to this. Simple, simple gesture. So I decided to do a couple of experiments. The first thing I did was uh, an application, a mobile phone application called iCaroler back in 2009. And iCaroler synchronizes um, all the local uh, phones, people who are participating, so that every single person in the room gets their own singer on their own phone, and they sing Christmas carols. Is that going, or do I have to click again? Anyway, you know the song, so I'm not going to keep going. What comes after that for Calling Birds? Um, so I got a patent on this technology for a very, very low cost method for synchronizing an unlimited number of electronic devices. Um, and I thought this is a very, very powerful concept because now we can start making our behavior and our electronic devices social again, you know? So I built some physical prototypes, pardon my little bizarre um, handcrafted things, um, but I licensed it to a company in China. We did a number of prototypes. I'm not gonna talk too much about this project because I don't have much time, except I love this one, which was um, a series of storybooks that kind of helps give the idea of what's possible um, with this type of technology. You buy a storybook, it's got a couple of characters, you take them out, they're standalone um, because they're all connected wirelessly, and they sing songs together, and they read the story in the book. But the great thing about this is that it's infinitely extensible. So if you buy the farm series and then you buy the Jungle Book, when the Jungle characters are telling their story, if you've got the farm guys there, you know, when the farm, uh, when the farm guys finish their song, or when the Jungle guys finish their song, the, the farm guys are going to clap and they're gonna laugh at the jokes. So, and the, the larger your collection gets billed, the more dynamic the whole thing becomes and the more real the whole thing becomes. Now, my next experiment in this area was in two, uh, 2013 in Santa Monica. Um, I was really, really interested in extending this into a really, really large scale. So I had the idea of creating a large scale crowdsourced artwork on the beach in Santa Monica for their biennial, triennial, um, quadennial, it, not very, very regular festival of uh, um, visual art on the beach. And I don't know if you can see the motion, oops, again, with the, I don't know if you can see the motion of the pixels up there. My idea here was that instead of moving the, the um, image, move the pixels and create the image by having pixels and geotag the beach with certain areas that when you walk over this area of the beach, now my phone is blue and now it's green and now it's blue. So I figured I could paint a huge, huge painting, oh, poor choice of words, on the beach um, using people as pixels. Oh, there's the animation. This was just a concept sketch. Obviously, it was never going to look like that. I started crafting the experience on the ground. Um, what's it going to look like? Because nobody's going to see the bird's eye view. It's got to have some compelling experience on the ground. Um, it had to operate at multiple levels. So I did a couple of conceptual sketches. And then I did a number of computer simulations to, uh, you know, how am I going to organize color in a large space um, and make it meaningful? And as I was doing these simulations, I realized that they created stunning imagery in and of their own right. And I got really obsessed with that for a while. But I had to finish the project, so we chose a, a spot on Santa Monica uh, on the beach. Um, it was about 200 meters square, and people got the app, and they downloaded the app, whoops, again, with the laser. Um, you could see where you were. This was the zone that was active. 
As soon as you activated the zone, entered the zone, your phone changes color, and you become a pixel in this really large scale work of art. The other thing that I did is that, is there a video running here? Yeah, is that I live tracked the GPS data from all of the phones. So we collected that data in real time, and we used it for a secondary artwork to create data visualizations um, that showed really where people were as they came in and uh, entered and left the spaces. So, and then what we did with that is we projected it on the side of a hotel at a different site. So the people on the beach couldn't see the large scale artwork that they were creating. They only saw, you know, they had the experience, the intimate, really it turned out to be an intimate experience of being on the beach with their phone that just had a single color. Now I have to tell you, I've presented this concept to a few places um, and they've said, what? You're gonna tell me that you're gonna, you know, engage somebody's interest by making their phone a single color? Get out of here. And I've actually heard that, I really have. Um, there are people who don't get this. And, um, and then, you know, what I really wanna say is, you know, look at this experience and look how compelling it was. Um, at the peak, we had 7,500 to 10,000. I never got a final count. Um, but this was the meaningful part of this for me. The sound that it makes when you put them all together the now experience. And even We're if shaking them doesn't do anything. We're also not sure if shaking it does anything. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> So that was the most rewarding moment for me because people on the ground had no idea what the piece was about. They were just told to show up at this location with their phones and they naturally kind of clustered into these groups and shared this experience together. And I was a fly on the wall there. That was not stage. I just kind of wandered through the crowd and listened to what people said. And that was extraordinarily satisfying. So I continued this work um, with, with simulated data. You know, I simulated the motion of crowds um, to create further artworks. And I wound up doing another series of pieces which I call drawing agents. Um, and this is what happens when you take autonomous agents. These are little software, little software bugs basically. And you give them a life and you give them some, you know, some, some motives and you put them in an environment where you can control gravity and color and other things and you let them run loose. And I just let them run loose and I take snapshots. That's really what these are. It's like watching these little things play and I go click, you know, just like when I'm playing with my dog in the park. I don't have a dog, but if I did have one. Um, so I did a whole bunch of these. Um, and, but the thing is, you know, this whole talk is about 2D and 3D. I'm a 3D guy, you know, and I'm not satisfied working on the screen. So what I did is I decided to take the pattern and make a bunch of neckties, you know, one, one of which I'm actually wearing right now. So, um, and you know, that kind of leads me to the next part of the segment, which is what Louis has introduced. This is what Louis has promised you about the border towns. And I would say that this cultural shift, this navigation between 2D space and 3D space is the most important cultural shift that we're facing right now. And uh, I just want to play a very short video clip here, because I think this is a great cultural example of uh, how we're dealing with it. So we can all do this now. Flip between 2D space and 3D space. Mind-blowing, isn't it? So in the, in the Super Paper Mario game, um, Mario uses this, this power to kind of solve puzzles. So here is a case. So he can't get over the ledge. He's gonna fall. What does he do? I don't know how to get over the ledge. Flip into 3D space. And there's my bridge to the other side. So in what little time I have remaining, um, I did want to kind of put all this in a historical perspective. And I do, I know Paul said on the way in, he said, if you're, we're here for the future of immersive technologies, not the, not the history, if you're here for that, you're in the wrong place, I'm in the wrong place. Because I do want to talk a little about the, the um, history of uh, these techniques, because you'll find that they're really, really old that almost everything that we do, even with the most advanced technologies today, the way I really like to put it is that everything new is old again. Um, and my first example is the trompe l'oeil. So this trompe l'oeil, which is in uh, Rome, was painted in around 1680 maybe, I forget the exact year, but 
it takes the architectural features and it recreates them in two dimensions in the fresco on the ceiling and extends it. And it's actually a first person, pers I mean, a one point perspective that um, resolves here and adds the fictional element. So if you want to bring fictional or narrative elements into the world with physical elements, trompe l'oeil is one of the first techniques we used for that. Um, this is a one point perspective. Force perspective, which it's still being used in film, television, theme parks, everything else today. So this is really essentially an extension of the same technique um, that we're still doing. The problem is, as you can see here, is that all forced perspective depends upon a single point of view. So as soon as you change your point of view, you lose the illusion. So you have to control the point of view in order for this technique to work. Um, there's another interesting thing I'm seeing a lot lately these days. Um, I love this artist. Um, I call this reverse trompe l'oeil because he's going from three-dimensional space into two-dimensional space. And this type of experience can only be experienced or enjoyed through a two-dimensional medium because as soon as you get into three-dimensional space, the illusion gets shattered. Um, even though I must say that this is one of the most stunning images I've ever seen. Um, I love this work, but I don't think it works in real space. I think if you were in this space, because you have stereoscopic vision, because when you move, you know, because when you move, um, the illusion gets shattered. So it only works in 2D space. Um, and this is the most recent version of this that I've seen, um, of this reverse trompe l'oeil. This is a large scale project that was done last year in Cairo. Um, so another form of trompe l'oeil sculptural called trompe l'oeil. This actually stems back to one of my kind of seminal experiences. I attended the New York World's Fair in 1964 and 1965, and that shaped my brain. I'm absolutely convinced of it. And there were some sculptures there um, by this artist, O'Connor Barrett, um, that took advantage of three-dimensional trompe l'oeil. Whoops. And the basic idea there was he provided, you know, there's these concrete blobs that are unrecognizable, but when you look through the viewpoint, all the pieces line up and you get to see an animal. And you know, as a five-year-old, I was just so overwhelmed by this. It, I'm, I'm sure, you know, but getting back to Louis' question yesterday, I'm sure it changed the way I perceived the world. So art does have that impact on us. These experiences that we're creating, they change our minds, they change the way we think. Our industry is so incredibly influential. Um, and I am so grateful for the people who did it. And we have a new kind of uh, trompe l'oeil now I refer to as media trompe l'oeil. Now media trompe l'oeil, one example of media trompe l'oeil is when the news announcer also reads the commercials. So you're hearing the message from the same voice, so they have the same truth value. So they're put into the same plane. So I'm saying, you know, stock prices are up 35% today. Oh, and by the way, Colgate is the best toothpaste ever made, but because they're both coming from my voice, they share truth value. And it's a technique that people have been using, you know, forever. It's a very powerful technique. It really works. But this is a really, really creative technique. So Progressive Insurance and their agency, they have a problem because they have a product that has no substance. You can't pick it up. You can't touch it. Most people can't even understand it. So what they did is that they used these techniques of media trompe l'oeil and of moving between two and 3D spaces to create a fictional 3D world. They gave this thing that has no substance, they gave it materiality. You know, and they put it in this environment, and it's extraordinarily convincing. So at our company, we pay about the same, even though I'm a great driver, and he's... Oh. Anyway, you've seen these. I'm not going to go into it anymore. Um, so trompe l'oeil is one of these techniques from, from history that we continue to use. Um, it requires a fixed point of view. You can't change your point of view or the whole illusion gets shattered. So the next technique that we continue to use comes from the panorama. Now the panorama is an extraordinarily well-designed structure. So the point of view is controlled by this railing and the canopy. So you never see the seam, you never see the seam between the um, backdrop and the structure. And that's a technique we continue to use. So the frame has been um, removed and it heightens the illusion. It also, by the way, has a pre-show. Uh, pre so the pre-show is the stark hallway here. So this is that transitionary space that I think um, John was just talking about as well. So, you know, this, this is 1793, folks. So you go through the dark space here, come up and you're into this completely transformed world. And we still use these techniques so the cylindrical 
projection is very similar to the toroid, the toroidal screen, um, because essentially we don't live in a sphere because we don't really spend a lot of time doing this or doing this. We live in the inside of a cylinder. So our, a toroid is actually more accurate. It's a flattened sphere, but never mind the technical details. So, you know, you don't really have to do a lot up there or a lot down there, but you have to do everything here. So the 360 degree spaces make a lot of sense. Um, another technique that's been used to, to re-engage um, between 3D and 2D is the multiplane camera. So the multiplane camera, you know, developed at the Disney Studios, restored parallax into what was a flat medium. And I'm just going to show one really quick famous example from Bambi. So the fact that the camera is moving, but the foreground moves at a different rate from the background. So that's a way of restoring um, the sense of depth in a two-dimensional space. And of course, there's Pepper's ghosts. And you know, I don't even know that I need to talk about this much. And one thing that does frustrate me, like for example, at the Billboard Music Awards, um, they refer to this just as the Hakone Miku, the um, Japanese superstar, as holograms. These are not holograms. This, this is Pepper's ghost. So this is the exact technique that was used 200 years ago you know, of reflecting an image that's not there and blending it with the physical space that is there. I'm not gonna play this video because I'm sure you've all seen it. Now, I think this is a really neat kind of update to the idea of Pepper's Ghost because it combines both Pepper's Ghost and the multi-plane camera to create a multi-plane Pepper's Ghost. And I think for spatial designers, this is actually kind of a smart approach. And I think there's some possibility here um, to put both of these techniques to good use in real physical spaces. Um, and then there was the Phantasmagora, another kind of form of entertainment. Um, and we have modern versions. This is really more about projection mapping. Phantasmagoras, Magorias, they projected spirits onto objects embedded in the environment. So the projection mapping that we have now, of course we have a different form of Phantasmagoria now. In fact, there are spirits floating amongst you right now. Um, and I could probably find one if I took my phone out. So actually, I think right there, there's a little Pikachu. So the, the latest version of the Phantasmagora is the Pokemon, Pokemon Go. So, and, but this is one of the really bizarre things about what's happening in culture right now. Because as we start geotagging things, these things are here. We are surrounded by ghosts and spirits. And in fact, the word medium, you know, which always meant, you know, bringing the spirits back into the space, these media are doing exactly that. That we are embedding spirits into our environment that we can summon up at will through our media. Um, Pepper's go I'm not going to get into these technical details. I want to get to stereoscopy because I'm running out of time and there are a couple of really important points I want to make. Um, then there was stereoscopy, again, an old technology. You know, the headset that Louis put on earlier? Did nothing, again, everything old is new again, or everything new is old again, however you want to put that. Um, the thing about stereoscopy is that stereoscopy is a space and body denying technology. You put this thing on, and you're, you're shutting out everything else in the world. You're shutting out your physical connections, your social connections, um, and it creates bifurcated experiences, and it denies the body. So one thing that's really important here is that technology is not ideologically neutral. And when we look at technologies and we choose the tools for storytelling or enlightenment and education, we have to choose very, very carefully. Um, I had one student, by the way, at UC San Diego who created this piece to kind of throw this point home, he created a complete body denying suit. It's a headset with earphones, um, but he has a camera and a microphone. So he's in the same space, but he's not experiencing any of it directly. It's all being mediated electronically. I shouldn't have done this, but I let him run through the space on his own. And fortunately, he survived the experience. But he's seeing what's in the room through his cameras, and he's hearing what's in the room through his microphones. But he doesn't have a direct physical connection to those senses. Um, with AR, Pepper's Ghost, um, it requires mediated devices. You have to view it through a two-dimensional screen instead of a three-dimensional space. Um, so I don't think these are great options either. I think ultimately, hybrid reality or hybrid design is the answer that really gives us everything that we want in this business. It gives us shared social experience. It re-promotes physical space as primary over digital space. It reclaims that territory. It says, you know what? Space and body are important. Um, and I think that's really, really important point. So 
Um, there are some other techniques. I'm really just going to skip right by them because I, I don't want to miss my conclusions. Technology is not ideological, no true. When we choose these technologies, we are making choices about what kind of world we want to live in. We are making choices about what kind of stories we want to tell and how we're going to offer them to people. And I think when we introduce new technologies, I love this quote from Neil Postman, we really do have to do it with our eyes wide open and with a sense of responsibility for ourselves and for our audiences. And that responsibility includes the idea, do I really want to close people up so that they're going to spend all of their time playing games in their room with no human contact? And you know, you've all read about the cases of people who've had their children die because they're spending all their time in the internet cafe. And these aren't made up. They're isolated cases, fortunately, but they do happen. And what's really happening is that we're dematerializing our culture. And this is another great quote that I like. You know, Uber, world's biggest taxi company, no, no taxis. They don't own anything. Airbnb doesn't own any real estate. They're controlling the interface. So it's a, it's a dematerialization, not just of our culture, but a dematerialization of our businesses, is that the person who can offer the interface doesn't have to deal with the substance. So there are very, very powerful economic forces at work right now who are driving us down this path, even if we don't want to go there even if we want to stay in the physical world. And we have to be very, very careful about this and very, very sensitive about it. Why are they doing it? Right? It, it's a lot easier to simulate an environment than it is to actually, you know, bring the brick and mortar to the site and, you know, hire construction people. Um, you know, I used to buy these things. I had a level. I think I paid for These are late prices from Amazon. Um, but now I get it all for free on my app. And the fact of the matter is, Everything in the digital world converges to free. And, you know, the way the music industry has been transformed is an example. Do artists like this? No. So when you, when you drive the cost of something down to free, you devalue it. It becomes worthless. I have students who listen to Spotify and Pandora, and they would never pay money to actually listen to music. So, so who pays for it? They don't realize when you're not paying, you know, when you're not paying for a service or when you're not paying for a product, you are the product. Um, so we've seen architecture being replaced by UI. And now I just want to introduce you to Boyer's Law before I close this thing out. Um, Boyer's Law, anything that can be digitized will be digitized. And this is something I think we have to guard very, very carefully against. Do you know that they're making epiretinal prostheses now? <laughs> So, and this is really kind of important too, these are retinal implants. So everything that currently is preocular, you know, all of the things we do, even the VR stuff, they go in front of our eyes, but it's really not very far until we get there. And you know, the only difference really between these preocular and postocular experiences is that the guy on the right can actually get up. So I've got a call to action. I think, you know, for those of you who care about these things, um, we really have to reclaim our role in the world. And we have to protect architectural spaces and entertainment spaces and physical spaces by using some of these techniques um, to reclaim that. And I think if architects don't redefine media space, media space will redefine architecture as it is currently. Um, and we have a responsibility to not let that happen, if, unless we wanted to. I personally don't. Um, I'm going to close with what I think is the most ironically tragic photograph I've seen. This is taken in Beijing by a Getty photographer. It is a huge digital display in a smog-ridden city of blue skies. And, you know, when you devalue physical space, when you devalue the world, this is what comes with it. So you replace it with its representation. And this is what Magritte was warning about. So finally, to wrap up, I'm going to do my, give my final um, homage to Magritte. So thank you very much. <laughs>